What is the one sin that you must stop doing before God will save you? In other words, in order to be saved. You see, there's actually a sin out there that is so vile and so disgusting in God's sight that He requires that you stop doing it before He'll save you. You see, salvation is not what you do. Salvation is what God has done, and it's up to Him to grant it to whoever He will. And there's one thing that you can do that will keep Him from giving you that salvation, that free gift of salvation. There's one sin. I'm going to talk to you about it in this study. But uh, a lot of people out there, atheists in particular, they'll talk about God just being so cruel, and how can you say God is love when God would send somebody to hell and burn them for all of eternity? Well, it's because of this one sin that God does that. And when you understand what the sin is and how serious it is, then you understand that God is justified in sending somebody to hell to burn forever. You say, what sin could be so terrible? Is it drinking? No, it's not drinking. Is it drugs? No. Is it rape? Is it child molestation? Is it anything like that? No, it isn't. I'm going to show you from the Bible today, the King James Bible, what this sin is and why it's so serious. You say, what is the sin? Very simple, self-righteousness. Because if you're self-righteous, then you can't ever have the righteousness of Jesus Christ be given to you. It is a sin condemned in the pages of Scripture. I'm going to show you the verses. And if you are a self-righteous person, God will never save you. Let's look at the Scriptures. Romans chapter 10. And you need to get a Bible and actually read along. A lot of people just sit there and watch videos and kind of with their mouth hanging open and don't really, you know, follow along and whatever else. And that's why they're easy, easy to deceive. I'm not here to deceive you. I'm here to show you what the King James Bible says and to get you to look it up in your King James Bible and make sure I'm telling you the truth. This is your standard. Not here. Or any other preacher out there. Romans chapter 10 verses 1 through 4. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. True for any Bible-believing Christian, by the way. You will have a heart for Israel. You won't hate the Jews. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Are the Jews zealous for God? Absolutely. You get an Orthodox Jew or an ultra-Orthodox Jew or whatever else. I'm not talking about modern Jews that could care less about God or whatever, just secular. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the Orthodox Jews. Yeah, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, look at this, and going about to establish their own righteousness. What is that? Self-righteousness. That's the most serious sin that there is. Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You say, what is the righteousness of God? Keep reading. For Christ... Jesus Christ, in other words, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You say, well then belief, salvation is just a belief. It's just an intellectual thing. No, 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 no. You have to come to the end of your self-righteousness. When you realize what Jesus Christ did on the cross, you aren't going to say, hey, I'm, I'm a good, good person. Then why did he have to die such a terrible death on the cross if you're such a good person? Was it he died the terrible death for the really bad people, but not for you? You can just say, well, I believe he died, and you know, it's, I guess, technically, we're all sinners. No, no, no. You're a dirty sinner. You're a rotten, filthy, dirty sinner. So am I. None of us are good. That's what the Bible says. There's none good. Nobody can say, I'm a good person, unless you're self-righteous. You see? And you go about to establish your own righteousness. Notice that. It isn't, well, I, I feel that I'm righteous, therefore I am, whatever. No, no, no. They go about to establish their own righteousness. That's the purpose of religion, you see. Organized religion is all about you having a cloak for your sin, number one. Number two, so that you can go about to establish your own righteousness. As long as I go to Mass, as long as I go to confessional, as long as I uh, live without electricity and drive around an Amish buggy, and dress in all black polyester. What are they doing? Establishing their own righteousness. That's why they all believe they can lose it. Righteousness is kind of a little meter, you know. You get kind of, or the or scales, whichever one you want to make. You know, I'm doing all these things and penance and whatever else. And, oh, it's tipping the scale over this way. I'm sure I'm righteous. Look at me. Oops, I went out and I got drunk and I, I kind of 
had an extramarital affair. Uh-oh, it went down a little bit. I better do some good works again. You're going out to establish your own righteousness. Luke chapter 18. I don't like your sarcasm. I can't stand your sarcasm. Um, sarcasm comes from somebody that knows what they're talking about, first of all. It doesn't have any time for uh, politically correct speech. And if you're not into that, you'd rather have somebody lying to you, some smooth, slick con artist that's sitting in some big multi-million dollar church building with a nice suit and tie on, go watch something else, all right? I'm going to be straight with you. I'm going to be honest. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 much like Jesus Christ was, by the way. Verse 9, Jesus speaking here. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And look at this. And despised others. You know the mark of a self-righteous person? Boy, have I run into him in my life. I'm a good person. I say, no, you're not. I've never stolen. I've not committed adultery. I've not ever raped anybody. I've never murdered anybody. What are they doing? Trusting themselves that they are righteous and they despise others. Hey, I'm no Adolf Hitler. What are they doing? They're comparing themselves with other lost people. I might have, I'm no, I'm no saint. I love that one when they say that. Yes, you're definitely true on that one. I'm no saint, but at least I haven't done whatever. I'm a good person. I've done good things. I taught Sunday school for 20 years. I'm not a bad person. I was, I was a deacon. I gave good tithes and offering at church. I was baptized as a baby. Trusting in yourself that you are righteous. I'm a, I, I, I work at the Torah Institute. I've studied the Torah and for years and I've taught and everything else. And, and you know, I've taught at a seminary and, and I, I've, I've trained a lot of things. I've been a missionary for many years and, and whatever. What are you doing? If that's the stuff that you're counting on for your salvation, all you're doing is going about to establish your own righteousness. And you'll look down at the dirty, filthy people out there. You find enough filthy people to give you a nice pedestal that you can stand above them and look down and say, well, I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not like the people down below, you know? Verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Pharisee is a religious man. The publican is a government tax worker, essentially. Essentially like a modern IRS or whatever you have in your country. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee. Notice he prayed to, uh, just with himself, by the way. The Lord's not even hearing him. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. See? despise others. Hey, I might be a, I might have a few little things, little issues here, but uh, at least I'm not like a filthy government tax collector, kicking people out of their homes and, you know, whatever else, because they aren't paying their taxes. I'm not quite that bad, you know. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of church building people. I do nice things. I helped an old woman across the road the one time, and and I, I you know I used to, I've 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 volunteered for the Boy Scouts, and I'm a member of the Masonic Lodge, and and I you know I'm I'm part of the Lions Club, okay. I got an award from the Rotary Club for the service I did in my local community. What do you tell me? I'm a bad person? Yeah, <laughs> run into it many times. Verse thirteen. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Hmm. Have you ever been there? Broken? Realizing you've made a mess of your life and you have no chance of ever getting into heaven? Somebody comes up to you and say, oh, you're a good person. You look at him and you just say, you don't even know me. I'm not a good person. I'm rotten. I'm terrible. Why don't you come to church? We'll, we'll fix you up. <laughs> you know, and you go, I've been to church. I've done this and I've done that and nothing works. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the end of somebody's self-righteousness. You see? And what does Jesus say about these two? 
Verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. Self-righteousness. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Humbling yourself? That would mean uh, you have to drop the, your uh, pride. That's really the, uh, the kind of the key ingredient to the sin of self-righteousness. Pride. Oh, you don't like to have somebody call you, call you a sinner, do you? Oh, that's, that's, that's just nasty, isn't it? Well, you better take your position because you're going to be judged by a perfect, holy, righteous God that knows everything you've ever done and that knows every thought that you've ever thought and every dirty, wicked thing that nobody else knows about. He knows. He knows. You're not going to get up there and, and say, uh, I'm a good person. And he'll say, oh, oh, did you do something I didn't know about? Well, yeah, you didn't see it the one time, God. I did. I, I helped this person. and I gave money. You weren't aware of that. And God's going to say, oh, you're right. I didn't know. We'll go on into heaven. I'm sorry. I'm, heroes are going to condemn you and burn you to hell and hell, you know, forever. And, uh, I didn't realize how good a person you are. And yet that's what the vast majority of people think. They literally think that they're going to stand before a holy, righteous God and God's going to say, uh, I, I didn't understand. I, I didn't realize how good a person you are. I don't think so. Philippians chapter 3. Show you another portion of scripture here. And of course, there's so much we could go over here to prove my point. I mean, you know, if you can earn it, why on earth did Jesus die? You know? So it's always it's always just amazed me. I'm a good person. I remember I said to the one time this guy is talking to him, witnessing to him at a gas station, and uh, he says, you know, thought I was a Baptist. I said, no, I'm not a Baptist. <laughs> You know, King James Bible believer, and he gave me this kind of, huh, you know, look. And uh, and he said, yeah, he said, you know, I understand there's some, you know, uh, you know, stuff about the gospel and whatever else. And and uh, and I said, do you need to be saved? And he said, well, he said, I'm not that bad a person. I said, then uh, why did Jesus die on the cross? Did he die for you? Well, uh, you see, he thinks he's a good person. Jesus had to die for some really bad people, you know, some drug addicts or prostitutes or whatever else. But he didn't have to die for me because I'm, I'm not that bad. It wasn't my fault. I mean, here's Jesus there dying on the cross, screaming in agony and things. And, you know, but that's not for me. You see? Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. I think I said chapter 4 originally. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. Paul, speaking here, greatest Christian that ever lived. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Isn't that interesting that Jesus Christ gives a parable of a Pharisee and a publican, and the Pharisee is self-righteous. That's what Paul was. Hmm. Jesus doesn't identify who the Pharisee is. Wouldn't it be something if he was talking about Paul? I don't know. But, you know, Paul was a Pharisee. Kind of an interesting thing there. Verse 6. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. You mean Paul was self-righteous? Yeah, he was going about to establish his own righteousness. With what? The law? Keeping the law? You say, well, how can you be blameless if you're... You, nobody was able to keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. Well, yeah, I'm aware of that. But you see, within the system of the Old Testament, you could do certain sacrifices that would take away those... Well, I shouldn't say take away, that would cover those sins. You see? So you could, you could work the system, much like a modern-day Catholic does. See, well, I can go out and I can do these wicked things, and I just go in and I can do my confessional to the priest, and then the priest tells me what kind of penance I need to do, be it give money or community service or whatever else, and I take care of it, and then I'm back in good terms again with the church. I have my venial sins kind of taken away, you see? 
That's what Paul was doing. He was working the system. Verse 7, But things, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Huh. He lost some things when he got saved? Yeah, you might say his life changed. A lot of false prophets out there saying your life doesn't change when you get saved. Why? They're self-righteous. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Boy, what the uh, right attitude to have there, you know? Your past lost life that you had, what do you think about that? It's dung. You say, well, uh, you're a military veteran. Thank you for serving your country. You say, yeah, it was a bunch of crap. Dung <laughs> is the Bible word there. It was a bunch of dung. But you served, you served God and country. No, it was dung. Hey, uh, you know what? I had a PhD from such and such seminary. Yeah, what do you think of it now that you're saved? Dung. You know, all that good stuff I did and all that, everybody says, oh, you were such a good person. You were one of the nicest teenagers I've ever met and one of the nicest young people and, and you've employee of the month and whatever else and you get saved. Dung. Verse 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, righteousness is, righteousness, excuse me, which is of God by faith. Yeah. The, the righteousness that you're supposed to have is the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. You can't earn it. Unless you want to say you can earn it by giving up your self-righteousness. Because you can't have both. You can't have your self-righteousness and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The two are mutually exclusive. You can't have both. And here's why a lot of the people don't want to really get saved. Verse 10. That I may know him, Jesus Christ in other words, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Oh, 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 you want to hold on to that dung a little bit longer there, don't you? Your religious things and your connections and your community affiliations and, yep. You don't want those other things that come along when you truly get born again. Oh, Christian, the Christian life's the best. The Christian life's the best. Well, in terms of you're going to go to heaven for all of eternity, yeah, it's great. But in terms of this life, it's not very good. Let's just be straight about it. I'm just going to tell you. You're going to have family turn against you. You're probably going to lose your job. You are going to have spiritual attacks happen to you. Uh, people are going to laugh at you. People are going to mock you. That's not a good thing. But what's the alternative? Die in your self-righteousness and be sent to the lake of fire in eternity. The choice is yours. But don't think you can get saved with your self-righteousness. Verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You see, what do all those verses mean? Very simple. When you get saved, you don't become sinlessly perfect. But your self-righteousness is gone. And now that the self-righteousness is out of the way, now the Lord can start coming in there and He can start to tell you what to do and how to clean your life up. Yeah, things change. But why? Because you gave up your self-righteousness. The pride's gone. And now it doesn't matter. Now, I can't tell you how many false converts I've run into, and it's been a great sadness to me. I see people, they hear the gospel, and they say, wow, you know, I want to go to heaven when I die. I don't want to go to hell. And they, they go through the whole thing, and they make a profession of faith. But there's that little bit of self-righteousness there. 
it's not dung in their eyes, that past life. And they, they're, I'm a Christ, Christian now, and they're going along like this, walking along, but they keep turning and looking back at that lost life, and they kind of take a step back and, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to, I decided to follow Jesus. Just hold on a second here. Oh, man, I used to love that restaurant. Okay, they had some booze there, and there was some rock music, but I, boy, I sure miss that. And, uh, boy, that, that, I like that job I had. It, I think I could do that as a Christian. And, 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 uh, uh, boy, those friends, I, I haven't seen her in years. And, and I just, I'm just going to visit for a little bit and keep backing up, and backing up, and backing up. And all of a sudden somebody comes along and says, you're not living right. You're wrong. I think you're a false convert. And by the time they're way back there with the world and they say, who are you to judge me? How dare you say those things to me? Why'd you move back to the dung heap if you got saved? Because it didn't take. It's fake. It's a fraud. You never gave up your self-righteousness. God is not going to save a self-righteous sinner. Never going to happen. Oh, it's a heresy. You have to give up a sin. You have to give up self-righteousness. God will help you with the rest of the stuff after that. You see? Because then he can. You all right? If you come to him for salvation as a self-righteous sinner, and the Lord starts to say, hey, that needs to go and this needs to go, wow, I'm a, I'm a good person. Uh-uh, no. You come to the Lord as a sinner, broken. And the Lord says, that there, get that out of your life. Oh yeah, Lord, okay, I'm sorry about that. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't know that that was wrong. I, I see it in your word now. Okay, I'll, I'll get rid of that. Hey, I want you to do this for me, son. Okay, all right, okay, I'll do that. Oh uh, yeah, your friends don't think much of you. Yeah, yeah, whatever. What do I need to do again? You see? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. It's an old hymn, if you aren't familiar with it. I press toward the mark, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm going forward. I'm leaving the dung behind. You look back at that old life and you go, oh, oh, man, that stinks back there. Boy, I remember when I used to do that stuff. Boy, I'm glad I'm not doing that anymore. I'm getting out of that. But you see these people, they just keep on stepping back and stepping back and stepping. I, I made my profession of faith, but I'm a, it's okay. I'm saved. I'm going back to the, uh-huh. You never gave up your self-righteousness. Can't tell you how many of those people I've seen that have contacted this ministry, made a profession of faith, and they go right back to the world, right back to the dung. Like a dog going, dog sees dung someplace, they go over and they roll in it. They want to get that smell all over them. They just love the smell of you know, dung all over their fur, like a lot of you out there. I used to watch Brother Brian. I used to watch Denlinger's ministry, but boy, I don't anymore. Why? You never left the dung heap. That's why you get offended at me. Only one life it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. If you're saved. If you're lost, well, then you aren't even doing anything for Christ. You can't. God's not going to save you until you get rid of that self-righteousness. I pray you take heed to these things. Because if you mess up, you can, you can, you know, call me evil, call whatever, you know, whatever. I don't I care less, <laughs> you know. But you mess up. You gamble with your soul and you lose that soul. You're in hell for all of eternity. Weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth forever. I pray you, you think about this because time is running out. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.